Jeff Beachbone Barry. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and um, my 10% royalty from that drink. Um, <laughs> I'll change the bar. All right, <laughs> so we're here tonight to talk about. Everybody hear me all right? Um, the zombie, obviously, and to resurrect it, which is suitable, suitable for an undead cocktail, resurrect it to the position that it deserves. The zombie was the cosmopolitan of its day. It was that famous. It was the stuff that radio comedians made jokes about. It was stuff that travel writers wrote about. Um, Newspaper columnists made hay over it. It revolutionized drinking in the United States. It started the whole tiki craze that lasted 40 years. Uh, drink was invented in the Depression. It lasted all the way through to disco, basically, as the reigning cocktail of the time. Um, many, many reasons why. Some of them have to do with the taste. Some of them have to do with timing. Some of them have to do with American cultural and political history. And we'll get into all that stuff. Um, but the main thing about it was that it was strong. And that's what started it off. That's what first made it something that people wrote about, something that people joked about, something that people ordered to the point that it just started this whole tiki craze that we're enjoying a revival of now. Um, why? Why make such a strong drink? Well, Prohibition had just entered. Excuse me. Prohibition had just ended. Um, the drink was created the day after Prohibition ended, uh, put on the menu by 1934, and it was basically a poke in the eye of the anti-saloon league. Um, here was a drink that said, okay, we've had all these dry years, all these dry decades, couldn't get a drink. Now we're going to drink three drinks in one glass, just to make up for lost time. Um, it was a bender in a glass, basically. And that's basically what people were in the mood for. It was kind of a celebration. It was kind of this, um, this statement, you know, more than a drink. Um, and more than a statement, it was profitable. Um, because of the zombie, tiki bars became big news and big business. And all the way through the 40s and 50s, up into the 70s, you had places getting bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where they became like these tiki palaces, all built on this drink and the drinks that followed in its way. Uh, you didn't go to tiki places, um, and if you've been to them in their heyday, if you're old enough to, then you know this already, you didn't go for the food. Food was basically Cantonese food, basic uh, Chinese food, suburban Chinese food, dressed up with fancy names. Instead of chow mein, they might call it tiki's nest or something like that. But you really went for the bar, you went for the drinks. Um, to the point that places became just like really, really opulent, um, million dollar luxury restaurants. Here is one of the most expensive nights out in Beverly Hills, California, in La Cienega, which was Restaurant Row uh, in LA. And uh, circa 1962, I mean, look at the size of this place. Here's a car for scale. It's like a three-story A-frame. And when you got out of your car and you went to the ramp here, a rickshaw driver, would roll you up <laughs> this, uh, this thing here, and we'd show you everybody on this side. Uh, basically got into a rickshaw over here and brought you through the portals of paradise. And that, that symbology was very, very deliberate. Um, you were leaving Los Angeles and you were entering a Polynesia of the mind. Uh, you were entering the South Pacific as conceived by um, Hollywood art directors, very often moonlighting film production designers who do these interiors. You notice there's no windows. That was very deliberate. You were walking onto a fully closed off, um, womb-like movie set interior, uh, sort of a Disneyland with rum. And the idea was you forget about the outside world for a little while. You're going on a mini vacation. Um, here's another place at the height of the boom. This was the Kahiki in Columbus, Ohio. Again, here's the car and the size of the people going over these two-story high surround things. Oh. And this went probably all the way down there. It had an entire Polynesian village on the inside. There were seven dining rooms, um, each one in this different native style. It was like a self-imposed Samoan hut. 
There were three story high fake palm trees, aquariums. It was quite the production, um, just to let you know, this was just half of the place. It went all the way back there. Um, and these were the kind of places that tiki drinks, or as they called them back then, exotic drinks, or just tropical drinks, could build for you. So your evening in these places started in the bar. Uh, you were waiting for your table. Um, very often the bar was designed to look like an 18th century or 19th century sailing ship. Again, symbology, you're starting your voyage. You know, your voyage into the exotic east and the tantalizing delights within. So you were served a very expensive tropical drink as you were waiting for your table. Um, here we have a few at the Mai Tai in Fort Lauderdale, which has a very elaborate sort of ship theme there. Got your uh, Mai Tai, Pearl Diver, Missionary's Downfall, which we'll talk about in a bit. Rum Barrel, you see how they all came in either very uh, fanciful ceramic vessels or hollowed out pineapples or inside of hollowed out coconut. Um, very specially designed glasses for each drink. A little ice cone around the straw for your Navy Grog. Um, very theatrical presentation. Um, theater was like a very, very big part of this. Now, again, these aren't your sort of like uh, tacky, tacky tiki beach bar kind of things that we may associate tiki with today or did up until a few years ago uh, before the revival we have now. But these were the exact opposite of that. These were your big night out. Um, these were luxury restaurants. Um, <coughs> Very often built, as I mentioned before, at the cost of what in today's dollars would be millions. Museum quality artifacts, indoor waterfalls, uh, lagoons, you know, canoes hanging from the ceiling, very often that were shipped from the actual South Pacific. These were white tablecloth fine dining, only the tablecloth was top of print. And normally in fine dining, in a restaurant like this one, for example, at the, at the Empire, um, you have your cocktail to start. And then when your appetizers are over and it's time for the main course, you switch to wine. You did not do that in these places. You kept drinking these very elaborate, very expensive tropical drinks all the way through your meal. Here's the main course being served at the Mai Kai, a suckling pick, and everybody's got another round of drinks. He's got his rum barrel, she's got her mutiny, there's a couple of other things on the way. Um, nobody's drinking wine. A lot of these places didn't even have wine cellars. Uh, they had rum cellars. You would have a long list of the rums that went into your drink. Uh, but uh, wine was, you know, maybe two or three offerings at best. Even dessert came in the form of a tropical drink. Here's a flaming coffee grog being poured at the Mai Kai uh, as your last course. Um, and uh, let's see, again, theatricality, flame from a great height. So obviously, these drinks were good enough and interesting enough and theatrical enough to keep a 40-year-old industry going. These drinks were the wheels that turned uh, the, the economic engine of this whole Polynesian restaurant craze that lasted longer than any American drink fad. Tiki was the longest American drink fad in our history. So where did they come from? Who invented them? They all came from the mind of one guy. This guy, Don the Beachcomber, uh, he was born Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gant in New Orleans, and his dad ran a hotel there, got tired of the hotel business, went to East Texas as a wildcatter to try and strike oil, and he did. He became very, very wealthy, and when Ernest turned 18, his dad said, I'll give you a choice. I will pay for any college of your choice, if you want to go to the Sorbonne or Yale or Oxford, Harvard, wherever you want to go, I'll pay for it or I'll pay for a trip around the world, your call. But when either of those two choices has run its course, if you've gone around the world or you've finished college, you're on your own. I'm not gonna give you anything else. So Don, being a guy after my own heart, decided that college was too much work and chose the trip around the world. This was very important for Tiki because at this time, in the 1920s, nobody from the United States who wasn't really filthy rich traveled the world. You just didn't do it. You didn't even think about it. It was just too much money. Um, I mean, rich Boston Brahmins would, would send their kids to Europe to uh, finish them off, and um, you know, very rich people in, in uh, East Coast society or Knob Hill in San Francisco would send their kids off to Europe as well. But the idea of going to all seven continents and seeing 
what was then a lot larger world, not the global village of today, was something that very, very few people undertook. Don was in a very fortunate position, and he did that, and he took full advantage of it. He went around the world not once, but twice. He stretched his budget, crewed on freighters, um, and went to Latin America, Southeast Asia, uh, Philippines, South Pacific, Africa, Europe. <clears throat> the one place that really, really struck him was Tahiti. He fell in love with Tahiti. And he fell in love with the tiki style, with the whole um, oceanic art uh, that they had down there, and the mode of living, everything about it he loved. In each of these places, Singapore, Tahiti, <clears throat> Singapore, Tahiti, Hawaii, Philippines, South America. In each of these places, he tried the local cocktails, the local liquors. And he got an education in spirits that very, very, very few people in the United States at that time got, especially because it was prohibition in the 1920s. So if you were stuck at home, you weren't going to learn anything except how to make bathtub gin, probably. So Don got back home, broke. Uh, in Los Angeles, and parked cars. He was a valet. He worked in the downtown festival market, hauling crates around. Um, he did some bootlegging for a mobster named Tony Carnero, who ran a string of offshore gambling boats. And um, when Prohibition ended, the one thing he did have, which was his personality, very outgoing, charming guy, he leveraged that uh, into a deal with a small hotel off of Hollywood Boulevard on McCadden Place, and he opened up a bar. And just a little bit of uh, the lobby they carved off for him. There were maybe 40 seats total. And he started serving what he called his rum rhapsodies. And these were what we now call tea drinks. These were <clears throat> layered, complex rum drinks that nobody in Los Angeles had ever had before. And it became a sensation. Before long, the Hollywood community found out about it and beat a path to his door. You had Howard Hughes, who became a Beachcombers regular. You had um, the Marx Brothers, Buster Keaton, uh, Greta Garbo, Clark Gable, Orson Welles. Um, anybody who was anybody ended up going to Don the Beachcombers and enjoying his drinks. Drinks like the Missionary's Downfall, for example, or the uh, Navy Grog, which we talked about a little bit. Here's Don's menu from the 60s, Missionary's Downfall, a drink that even today, I mean, we serve it at uh, my bar, Latitude 29, and people drink it the way they would any other craft cocktail made in 2015, only this one was made in the 1940s, and it just stands the test of time. Um, Navy Grog, the one with the little theatrical ice cone, all of these other drinks, drinks and pineapples, etc. He came up with this entire menu, about 60, 70 drinks. And these very shortly found their way to other restaurants that wanted to cash in on this cachet, cash in on this trend that Don had started with Hollywood royalty going to drink these drinks. So these drinks spread all the way across the country. Um, and they were just given different names, but it was the same drink. It was all Don's menu. That was the template. Um, here is the Mai Kai. We showed you some stills of that before in Fort Lauderdale. Here, the missionary's downfall becomes the missionary's doom. Uh, and the Navy Grog becomes the Yeoman's Grog. Little tweaks of barrel rum, another Don drink. Um, but it's still the same Don the Beachcomber template here. Missionary and Yeoman. Boston was no exception. In fact, Boston was kind of a tiki mecca at one time. Um, enormous amount of places, all within a very small area. Uh, you had, in the Sheraton Hotel, Contiki Ports, which was like a five dining room place, very impressive. Five blocks away from Contiki in the Hilton, you had Trader Vic's. The Somerset Hotel, Polynesian Village. Uh, the South Seas was on, it says Harrison Avenue, is that right? Uh, okay, Bobley's Islander in Chinatown. Uh, the Aku Aku on Commonwealth. Um, here it is, there's the Aku Aku, Bob Lee's, the uh, South Seas. Now, Khalid, you're telling me these places were all fairly close together, but that's an interesting fact because it shows that even though you have six big opulent places all serving the same drinks, 
competing for market share, they could all still stay in business. That's how popular these places were. It was probably like the same thing as having a luxury version of having four Starbucks on, a, on four corners of a street. You know, one's full, you just go to the next one. So in all of his travels, where did Don get the idea for these tiki drinks? <clears throat> Remember, he loved the South Pacific, he loved Tahiti, he loved Hawaii. Um, he was in Singapore, where he had a Singapore sling. Well, he did not get his inspiration for any of these drinks in the South Pacific. He loved South Pacific style, he loved the decor, he wanted to open a South Pacific themed bar, but there weren't really any South Pacific themed cocktails you could put in that bar. Tahitians just drank French red table wine. Hawaiians just drank Gokulahau, which is basically a moonshine they brewed from the root of the tea plant. And um, the Philippines, yeah, they put rum and coconuts and pineapples, that's probably where he got that idea. But cocktails, very, very rare, if non-existent in the South Pacific. Don got all of his ideas from the Caribbean. Tiki drinks are basically Caribbean drinks, squared or cubed, and we'll talk about that. Uh, his main place of inspiration was the Little Bank Hotel in Kingston, Jamaica, which is kind of where all the um, smart set went uh, back in the 1920s. And it was at the Myrtle Bank. Don was married three times, um, but the love of his life, who was with him from the Myrtle Bank all the way to his dying day, was the planter's punch. <laughs> He fell in love with this drink in Kingston, and it became the basis, it became the foundation, the building blocks for almost all of those 60 or 70 drinks that he invented that all of these restaurants around the country, including Boston, copied and made millions of dollars off of. Now, Planter's Punch, um, as an old um, 18th century piece of dog roll goes, the old recipe, was classically one of sour, two of sweet, three of strong, and four of weak. Uh, the sour, lime juice, the sweet, sugar, the strong being a good dark punch rum like Myers or Peruba, and the weak being water. Well, this was the foundation for Don. Sour, sweet, strong, and weak. But if you make the drink this way, it's not that good. It's not that interesting. It's kind of one note, like most Caribbean drinks are, actually. Um, yeah, lime, sugar, and rum are all delicious together, but what Don did was he proceeded to square or cube each one of these elements. For Don, one sour lime, well, why just one sour? What happens if you combine more than one sour? What happens if you put lime and lemon in the same drink? What happens if you put lime and grapefruit juice and passion fruit in the same drink? Um, you've dimensionalized it, you've layered that one element. Did the same thing with sweet. Why just sugar? Uh, why not um, infuse the sugar with vanilla or allspice? Uh, why use? Why not use substitutes for sugar like honey, uh, which gives you a richer mouthfeel? Um, why not combine these things? Why not combine honey with like falernum, which is a Barbados syrup of uh, ginger, lime, and clove? What happens if you put those two things together? What happens if you put those things together with a passion fruit syrup? Um, so again, dimensionalize the sweet. Now, it was the strong, though, where Don was truly revolutionary. Um, I've done a lot of research, going back before his time, to see if anybody in the recorded <coughs> literature of the bar world ever mixed more than one rum in the same glass. I can't find anything, not in Jerry Thomas, not um, in anything before or after Thomas. Don seems to have been the guy, as far as I know, who came up with the notion of putting more than one rum in a glass to combine them all into a base spirit that no one bottle could give you on its own, no matter how good it was. Um, for example, the Planner's Punch calls for a dark punch rum like Myers. Well, Don might say, okay, fine. Why don't, what happens if we take a dry Cuban rum, uh, more, a little more floral, but also a little, um, a little less uh, dense, a little less sweet, and mix that with the Jamaican rum. Uh, what kind of taste do you get when you do that? And what happens if you add a third rum? What if you take a smoky, 
charred wood tasting rum from Guyana, Demerara rum, and add some of that to your mix of two rums and throw, the, throw another curveball and add another layer. And Don routinely did this in many, many, many of his drinks. Uh, just created this layered, interesting base flavor that he couldn't get out of one bottle. What one bottle can't give you, maybe three can. Um, now, another innovation was the wheat. Two ounces of water in any drink, I don't care what it is, is going to give you an insipid, far too diluted taste. Don turned the water into ice. For him, the wheat became crushed ice. And again, uh, he experimented with new technology as well as with new ideas about how to combine things in glass. At, in Don's day, the height of cutting edge culinary technology, the equivalent of liquid nitrogen or rotovaps or centrifuges and all the stuff that uh, molecular mixologists are using today, would have been the blender, the Hamilton Beach blender. Uh, it was basically an electronic swizzle stick, and it was a revolution in drink making. Um, he wasn't the first person to adapt the blender from a milkshake to a cocktail. That was um, a guy named Constantino Ribalago Verit in Havana at the Floridita bar. Um, he was making frozen daiquiris with that in the 30s. But Don took that idea and used it to make his rum rhapsodies. Now, he put a precise amount of crushed ice in that blender tin, so precise that if it was blended, and he only blended for like three seconds, three to five seconds max, just like, brrr, and that was it, um, what would happen with that precise amount of ice? It wasn't enough to make a slushy drink. He didn't want a slushy drink. It wasn't a frappe drink, most of his drinks. But it was just enough to A, chill the drink instantly, B, dilute it just to the point that he wanted that drink diluted to, to wake up that base spirit with a little bit, like the same way that you put a few drops of water into a glass of scotch, for example, just to wake it up. So he sort of wake up the drink, he instantly chill it, he'd aerate it to give it a really nice visual, and he would also give you a really nice mouthfeel when you're drinking it. Um, not a slushy drink, but uh, a fully liquid, liquefied and still really uh, dense and layered and fat kind of a drink. So he took this template and he just started experimenting and coming up with all of these famous drinks. Here's one called the Pearl Diver. Um, the sweet here is honey combined with passion fruit. And <clears throat> the sour is lime, um, two different rums, and flash blended to give you that really nice visual presentation. You have to um, head on the drink. Um, here's the skull and bones. The sweet here would have been pomegranate syrup mixed with, I believe, falernum. Uh, the strong would have been a bunch of rums thrown together in there. Uh, again, flash blended, um, lime, and who knows what else at this point. Uh, the rum barrel was a Baroque masterpiece. There's about 12 ingredients in that. Four different juices, um, uh, four different syrups, a dash of this, three drops of that, six drops of that. Uh, four different rums combined into a really layered base flavor. And none of this was random. This wasn't just, oh, throw a bunch of stuff in a tin and see what happens. This was, you know, cases of rum would go down the drain while he was experimenting with this stuff. And, you know, when I got to the point where I was picking these recipes apart and trying to streamline them and change them and cheapen them so that it didn't cost me a fortune every time I tried to make a drink, you cannot mess with his recipes. The guy was a genius. It, it was, he got it as good as it could get. Anything you were going to do was make it a lesser drink. Um, so, he had his rum rhapsodies, he had his menu, and people came, so there he is, at his, behind his little bar in Hollywood. It wasn't long, it was about three years, before he moved across the street. He bought this apartment building that was across the street from the hotel, and he turned it into the first on the Beachcombers restaurant. Uh, several dining rooms, um, a very long bar, usually a 60 to 90 minute wait out the door to get in. Once you did get in, here's the main dining room, um, you were liable to see Hollywood royalty sitting next to you. This right here is the Celebrity Chopsticks case, uh, right over here. And uh, movie stars like um, Orson Welles, for example, had their names burned into a bamboo case that held their own chopsticks. And every time they came in, they ceremoniously like unlocked the thing for them, showed, gave them their celebrity chopsticks. And I mean, that was, that was the kind of place it was. It was not Jimmy Buffett 
peach bar, tappy tiki stuff at all. Um, but there was trouble in paradise. Almost immediately after he moved into this place and long lines began to form, um, imitators wanted to get a piece of the pie. They wanted to make some of the money that he was making serving these rum rhapsodies. There's only one problem. They didn't know how to do it. Um, Don was breaking new ground with these drinks. Nobody was making drinks like this. You couldn't just hire a bartender and have him make these drinks. You had to know what to do. Well, there were a few bartenders who knew what to do, and they all worked for Don the Beachcomber. Um, this guy, Ray Bowen, was one of Don's original four bartenders from 1933. He'd been with the Beachcomber until they moved across the street. And around 1937, um, this guy, Bob Brooks, was going to open up the Seven Seas across, right across the street from the Chinese Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. And he wanted to serve tiki drinks in his tiki restaurant. Didn't know how to do it, but Ray Bowen did. And Ray Bowen at Don the Beach Comer was making $25 a week. Not bad money back then, actually, but Bob, Bur uh, Bob Brooks offered him $40 a week. He said, uh, Mr. Bowen, if you come over to my bar and install yourself there and um, serve these rum rhapsodies to my guests, I'll pay you more money. And Ray said, okay, I'll do it. And this was the beginning of the diaspora of John, Don's drinks. From this, they kept spreading and spreading. And Ray was the first, not the only, but the first guy to do this. He was sort of like Johnny Tiki Seed. After a year at the Seven Seas, he moved to Harry Sugarman's place, Sugie's Tropics, which was on Vine Street off of Sun, near Sunset and Vine. There's Harry surrounded by all of his employees. And you can tell this was not a small restaurant. This was his staff. Uh, and uh, this was an indoor village, by the way. All this had a, like a fake ceiling with a dawn to dusk lighting diorama and all that. So Ray went over there, and Harry Sugarman made him the same deal. He said, Ray, I'll pay you more money than Bob Brooks is if you bring these rum rhapsodies to my bar. Well, Ray was not stupid, and neither were all of the other guys who eventually left Don's, and they realized what they had, this secret knowledge that no other bartender shall know. They would very often make deals like the one that uh, another guy, Bob Asmino, will get to soon, told me about. It's like, okay, I have this little recipe book here. I know how to make Dom's drinks. Um, you hire me, and you can print up a really cool menu like the one I showed you of all these beautiful drinks. You can name them what you want, and I'll make them for you, um, and I'll tell you what you need to go buy you know, from the supply places, but I'm not gonna tell you my recipes. That's my business. And if I don't like it here, or if somebody offers me a better deal, I might just take my recipes with me, leaving you high and dry. Uh, and this happened. And a lot of guys made a 40-year career out of you know, having that job security, these secret recipes. And general managers and restaurant owners would all very often agree to that. Um, yeah, how else are we gonna get these drinks and make all this money? So one guy, um, as this kept spreading and spreading and spreading across the country, um, Monty Prozer, who ran a nightclub called the Copa, Copa Cabana in New York, very famous, Barry Manilow wrote a song about it. Yeah, that's right. This was where Lena Horngarter starts, she's pictured there. This is where uh, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis got their starts. And Monty Prozer owned about 40 places on the Eastern Seaboard. Uh, he was once interviewed in the 1930s, and um, the one quote I always liked was, yeah, I own a bunch of places, so what? He was his um, sort of a gruff, cigar-chomping guy. Anyway, he decided when he saw what was going on on the West Coast, all this money that was being made and the hip new thing to do, he went tiki. And he opened up another place of his, Monty Prozer's Beachcomber. Home of the Zombie was how they advertised it. This was in uh, Broadway 50th in Manhattan. And the zombie took New York by storm. Everybody went to Monty Prozer's to drink a zombie, to drink Monty Prozer's zombie, to the point where he soon changed his menu to this, Monty Prozer's Beach Tomer, home of the zombie, much bigger thing there. Uh, the drink went viral in Manhattan to the point where in 1939, the producers of the New York World's Fair contacted Monty Prozer and said, hey, will you serve zombies at the New York World's Fair? Um, and he did, he opened up like a hurricane bar. And this is the cover of a souvenir photo. You know, cigarette girls would come around with camera, take pictures of you and your date, and you would buy them at the end of the night. So this is the cover. Inside was this photo of a young couple. 
at uh, Monty Prozer's Hurricane Bar, happily drinking Monty Prozer's zombie, blissfully ignorant of the fact that Monty Prozer did not invent the zombie. The zombie was actually invented by John the Beachcomber, of course. In fact, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, it was his most famous drink. It was the drink that put him on the map, and it was the drink that put Tiki on the map. And here it is on his own menu. You, can, you notice that Monty Prozer not only stole the Beachcomber name, but even the type style, the font, and the signature drink. Um, Don actually ended up suing Monty Prozer. Uh, Monty Prozer used to tell people who came into his New York restaurant, yeah, when you're out in Hollywood, visit our place with Don and say hello to Don and Sonny. <laughs> so, it was a little too brazen, and he got sued. Um, anyway, so the zombie was just one of the 60 or 70 rum rhapsodies that Don came up with. Why that? Why did the zombie become so big? Well, I mentioned before, it was a strong drink. Um, and it was deliberately engineered by Don, who was quite the showman, quite theatrical, um, as a way to get men to drink tiki drinks. Like, no two-fisted, red-blooded American male in the 1930s was going to drink a drink called the Pearl Diver, served in a pretty glass with a geranium weight, or a Tahitian rum punch, or a pink Dr. Funk, or a, or a pretty green missionary's downfall. That was not very manly for the 1930s. Uh, you were supposed to drink a slug of scotch, or if you were you know, a top hatted top, you could have a martini, but no self-respecting dude was gonna drink one of these drinks. Well, Don wanted him to drink these drinks because he wanted to make more money. He didn't want these guys coming in and drinking martinis. He couldn't mark those up as high as he marked up a pearl diver or a missionary's downfall. Women were coming to his bar, and of course, men followed women. So what Don did was, he created a zombie and he said, I'm only gonna serve two to a customer, right there on the menu. And he created a challenge for these guys. He said, okay, climb Macho Mountain, drink two zombies and see what happens, you know. Um, and it worked. Guys started drinking this zombie. I can handle two zombies, that's nothing. And um, it became this like huge um, meme almost. Uh, as I said before, radio comedians would make jokes about it. And um, travel writers turned it into kind of a rite of passage. There were several articles from the 1930s that said the first thing you must do when your train pulls into Union Station in Los Angeles is take a cab to Don the Beachcombers and have a zombie. Um, and it, it was uh, a tourist attraction, the same way that uh, the beach or the La Brea Tar Pits were. Um, wasn't long before other companies besides restaurants decided to try and cash in on Don's most famous creation. This is one of the earliest bottled cocktails I know of. This is an ad for the Carioca Zombie. The Carioca Rum Company put out a bottled zombie. All you had to do was add soda water after you poured it into a glass. This was in 1942. The zombie had been around for a few years and it gotten so popular that you could just buy one in a bottle now. During the war, uh, most aviators, most bomber pilots, had their nose cone art done up as like Betty Grable or some long-legged bathing beauty. This B-24 crew decided to have a zombie as their mascot. Uh, that's how popular the drink was. You can see the little glass there. Uh, comic books started keeping, uh, keeping it alive themselves. They, when the whole monster movie craze hit in the 50s, you would have, uh, this, this was like a precursor to Mad Magazine. I think Harvey Kurtzman uh, was the artist here. Uh, special today, zombie. I'll have a zombie. I was hoping you'd ask, and then boom, it comes. So all the way from uh, B-24 bombers to children's comic books, the zombie was everywhere. It was on your cocktail napkin. Little joke there. Order a zombie. Um, it was so popular that bars and restaurants would name themselves after the drink. Uh, here we have the Zombie Hut in Sacramento, the Zombie Zulu in Oregon. Zombie Village, uh, it was right across the street from Trader Vic's in Oakland. And remember Monty Prozer, he still called his place the Beachcomber, but he turned it into a chain all up and down the seaboard. There was one in Miami, there was one in Baltimore, and there was one in Boston, um, 130 Boylston Street. Anybody know where that? Well, obviously, most of you probably know where that is. Uh, it's downtown, right? Yep. Yeah. So, um, and Cleve, you were telling me that it probably got turned into the Hawaiian. Yeah, okay, got turned into the Hawaiian later in the 60s. Crossbrook. It's now Emerson College. 
Oh, San Francisco is, isn't everything at this point. <laughs> so of course, you know, here's the home, here's the home of the zombie, and then you have people going one step further and just naming themselves after the drink. Uh, another place in Boston was sort of indicative of where the zombie was on most cocktail menus. This is the Hurricane. Um, it looks like it's from the 30s. The drink prices would lead me to believe that. Uh, it was on 95 Cambridge Street, um, next to Boyden Square Garage. Boyden? Boyden, Boyden Square Garage. And you can see when you open up the Hurricane's cocktail menu, the zombie's right there, pride of place on the top. Um, you know, only two customer pleas doing the same thing that uh, Don did. So, yeah, one pelican. So, Donna was getting a little tired of this, um, watching his baby, watching his moneymaker, watching the thing that put him on the map, get stolen away from him and other people making a lot of money off of it. He was tired of other bartenders stealing his drinks and repackaging them. So, he took some measures to stop it. Um, and one of the first things he did was he stuck all of his tiki bartenders in the service bar, in the back bar, away from customers. Um, you can see here, it was like a little sliding door. And uh, that door was closed until somebody in the front, like a Buster Keaton says, I would like to have a missionary's downfall, please. Then the bartender in the front bar would open up the little thing and say, oh, missionary's downfall, and the guys would close the thing and make it out of sight. So no <clears throat> rival restaurant tour could be watching and how it's done, or chatting up the bartender, trying to lure him away. And then when the drink was made, that would open up again, and the drink would be handed to him. So I think we have a few bartenders here tonight. I recognize some faces. What's wrong with this whole thing from a bartender standpoint? <laughs> no tips, right? You're in the back. The guy in the front who's doing nothing but mixing old fashions and pouring beer, he's making all the money. Whatever the split is, it's not enough. You're doing all the work. So this just encouraged more people to leave Don the Beach Conners. Didn't work that well. So Don tried another tap. He put his recipes in code. So if you're a new hire at Don the Beach Conners, um, if Brian over here gets a job <clears throat> as a bartender at Don's, he's handed the recipes. And what all he knows is, OK, this drink has like a half an ounce of Marquesa or a dash of Dom Spices number two, or a three quarters of an ounce of number six, or maybe some Mundrela. And that's all well and good for Brian because that's how the bottles behind the bar are marked. The bottles will have a label that just says number six, number four, Marquesa, whatever. Brian has no idea what's in these bottles. <coughs> He's just pouring them. And when uh, Monty Prozer, for example, hires Brian away to make drinks behind Monty Prozer's bar, Brian goes behind the bar and says, all right, Where's your Marquesa? Where's your number two, number four? I, I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm doing. This actually worked very, very well. This stopped a lot of the theft. Um, and so well, in fact, that it kind of ruined Don's legacy because after he died, nobody had ever published these recipes. Um, the bartenders who knew the code weren't telling anybody. And Don faded into obscurity. While well, Don's rivals, like Trader Vic, became famous because they actually wrote books and published their recipes. Anyway, I ran into the code myself um, a few years after I tried to find out what was in Don's drinks. I was getting nowhere. I went to the library, um, looked up every old cocktail book I could find. There was almost nothing published of Don's. And when I found zombie recipes, um, they were all guesswork. Don's secrecy worked so well, so few people really knew how to make a zombie, and the ones who knew weren't telling, that um, when cocktail book authors were contracted to write these, you know, books like the Esquire cocktail book from 1956, um, they were pressured by their editors to include drinks like the zombie. That's the most famous drink around. You gotta have a zombie recipe. Well, nobody was telling these writers what was in it, so they guessed. And every time I found a zombie recipe, and I found a lot of them when I was looking around, like here's, the Esquire book had three recipes and it was just straight bullets. It was just like, you know, blindfoldedly throwing darts at a wall. Say, well, <clears throat> okay, we know there's a lot of rum in it. Okay, dark rum, light rum, pineapple juice, papaya juice, if available. Um, you know, there's a zombie a la number one boy over here, a zombie a la Puerto Rico, zombie number three. 
they couldn't bring themselves to call it just the zombie because they knew it wasn't real, you know. Um, and they all tasted terrible. Um, you'd find other things in thrift stores and swap meets, little keys to this lost kingdom, the Orchids of Hawaii Bartender's Guide. Here's their zombie in the exact same mug that we served ours in, but they said, oh, maybe it has vermouth in it. Vermouth, orange curacao, sweet and, sweet and sour, you know, whatever. It's just put a bunch of stuff in a glass. It's fine. Um, and even Trader Vic, who was kind of a genius in his own right and worthy of his own 90-minute seminar, he couldn't figure out what was in a zombie. The Trader Vic zombie is a mess. He says, orange juice, lemon juice, orange lime juice, um, Peychaud's bitters, it's, it's all over the map. Um, so after a few years of trying to figure out what was in this drink, this drink that was so famous, it had to be awesome, but every one I was trying out of these books was terrible. And every time I went to a bar that served a zombie, remember this is the dark ages of the cocktail in the 1980s, it was even worse. So this is kind of what my dreams looked like at the time. Like, what's in that glass? Uh, will I ever know? Could David Embury be right? A drink book writer who in 1948 wrote, uh, this is undoubtedly the most over-advertised, over-emphasized, over-exalted and foolishly feared drink whose claims to glory ever assaulted the eyes and ears of the gullible American public, is what he wrote. And I was starting to think maybe he was right, because I'm not tasting anything good here. Then I ran into this book. Uh, it was a leather-bound, privately printed book called Barbecue Chef by a guy named Louis Spivak. I know nothing about him. I've never been able to find anything about him. Um, I don't know how many of these were printed. <clears throat> it was dated 1950, but there was a zombie recipe in it. And um, he counted among his friends Don the Beachcomber, as he wrote in the book, um, and Don graciously donated a zombie recipe to him. And I couldn't believe it. There was even a little thing saying, I, I originated and have served this thing since 1934. Anyone that says otherwise is a liar. Signed, Don. That's uh, right over there underneath the drink. So I tried the drink, and it was pretty good. Um, this was the first drink that you guys had as you came in, with the one in, one in the tiki mug. Uh, this a uh, 1950 Don the Beastcomber Zombie. Um, it's actually a very well-balanced, lovely drink. Um, and it's really easy to make. As you can see, it's a straight one ounce pour all the way down the line until you get to a teaspoon of brown sugar and a dash of bitters. Um, you know, nothing to it. Everything blends together. And I was happy as could be, I cracked, cracked the whole thing. I, I now knew what was in a zombie and I published it. Okay, I could rest easy now. Well, that didn't last long. Um, not long after Intoxica was published, too late to stop the presses, I found this magazine. It's called Cabaret Quarterly. It was a men's magazine that told you where all the good burlesque shows were around the country. This issue from 1956 had articles about Honolulu, New Orleans, Havana, and Miami. In the Honolulu section, they also had drink recipes in addition to uh, girly photos. They had what they claimed was Don the Beast Comer's zombie recipe. And they talked about how um, they bemoaned all of the bad imitations that were out there, and they said, we beseeched Don, we begged him for the real recipe at his place in Hawaii, um, and he gave it to us, and here it is. And I was like, oh, okay. So I tried the drink, and it was also delicious. It's the one you're drinking now in the uh, old-fashioned glass. That's the 1956 version of Don Zombie. Authentic, the real thing, said right there in print. As you can see from this recipe, it's absolutely